Everybody's got a story, you just have to listen. Hola, I'm Joe Partavilla, and this is Good Listen. And have you ever had to deal with a narcissist? Like, the word is kind of vague because everyone really throws it around, but what does it really mean? And I mean, what is the clinical definition of a narcissist? I know many of our political leaders have accused of being narcissists, but what's it like to live with one or be involved with one in real life? Well, today I'm joined by Vanessa Reiser. She is a licensed therapist and a narcissism expert. We're going to talk about her book, Narcissistic Abuse, A Therapist's Guide to Identifying, Escaping, and Healing from Toxic and Manipulative People. So we're going to get into all of that. Plus, we're going to find out why Vanessa decided to make this her life's work. Vanessa, welcome to Good Listen. How are you? Great. How are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you for asking. So I want to start with the fact that your specialty is something that I think most people don't think about. And now it's the word narcissism is a little more prevalent than it used to be. But why narcissism? Why was that something you felt was your area of expertise to sort of really dive into? Because of all the isms you could have got into, I'm sure there are a lot of others. Why this one? I did have my own experience. Um, and that really did catapult me into studying all of the ins and outs of personality disorders and, you know, the way that people with past pathological personality disorders behave. Um, and then because of my clinical background, I thought it was my obligation to advocate for those who have to suffer in silence when they're dealing with the judicial system and other scenarios. So I kind of thought it was my duty to um, scream from the mountaintops a little bit about what this was because it seemed to be something that people weren't really um, feeling empowered to talk about probably because they had someone's foot on their throat um, proverbially in the judicial system. So that was why I kind of made it my thing. Awesome. Um, so the word narcissist, I, I feel like like many of the words that therapists use in a clinical setting get thrown around willy-nilly and I'm sure it might make you cringe that when you hear people say that person's a psychopath that person's a sociopath that person's a narcissist um so let's get down to the actual definition of it because like like the psycho and and and, and sociopath people really don't even know what they're saying they're just it's they probably heard it on a podcast or saw it in a movie and they just feel like let's just label someone with this um so can you give us the clinical definition for a narcissist Sure. Um, these are people who have no empathy. So I would say that is ground zero for somebody who has NPD, narcissistic personality disorder, as well as antisocial personality disorder or sociopath and psychopath. So they don't have empathy. Um, why is this problematic? Because without empathy, our species does not exist. You know, mother hears the baby cry or father hears the baby cry and meets the needs of the baby. If we don't do that without empathy, we just don't exist. So people who think this is cool to not care and not be empathetic, we see this in a lot of political climates right now, it's problematic. We need to sort of get back into cultivating empathy as a species. So I would say no empathy is ground zero. Um, another big indicator would be um, addicts. So the, the narcissist is always addicted to attention um, and they feel very much a void if they don't have constant attention. So all eyes on me and they manipulate everything to get this coveted attention. Um, and then I would say manipulation would be probably the third biggest variable. Somebody who's highly manipulative, who's skilled. Um, these are the top three red flags, I would say. And you mentioned political climate. Uh, I don't know if you want to go there, but Donald Trump has been uh, called a malignant narcissist, probably since he since since he showed up as a a celebrity, quasi celebrity in the tabloids in New York, and uh, and you and as a life therapist, I'm sure you're not one to diagnose someone without meeting them. But does he give off that vibe of the the narcissist that that you kind of explain, like the the lack of empathy? I mean, you just you just roll through Twitter feeds of video clips of him just showing zero empathy when it comes to people, uh, to making the focus solely about himself. Uh, and for folks again whatever side of the political spectrum you're on, you 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 have to be blind to not see these things. But is that, is it obvious to you? Yeah, and while I can't diagnose him, I think, you know, clinically what we do assess for um, in um, sociopathy specifically, um, 
it's the way you would handle animals or the vulnerable populations. And he specifically does not have a dog. And every president, for the most part, with the exception of I right. think, two or three others, has handlers for the dog. I think he sees the dog as something that is rather inferior. Um, and so I, he he sort of sets off a lot of different red flags for me. Um, but the gaslighting would be um, another one where you know, if you call him out for saying something, there's no accountability. He kind of deflects, projects, sidesteps. Um, and so that is a big indicator of gaslighting. So, I mean, yeah, for sure. It's, for most of the clinicians in this space, he is, you know, sort of neon lights um, <laughs> glowing. That's funny. Uh, all right. So how, what are some of the, you mentioned red flags there. So what are red flags for people in in common law, <laughs> not talking about politicians or, or 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 you know or maybe future president who knows um what are common things i know you mentioned the empathy piece but as someone who's in a relationship with someone what are a couple of red flags that might pop up that say oh, oh god this this person might be a narcissist yeah somebody who is anxious or fast moving who has to one up others so they tend to be highly competitive vindictive um and they have to win so they are fast drivers, they are line cutters, they are um, always one-upping. They have no boundaries. So these are people, if you're at work and they're constantly texting or calling, or if you're in the bathroom, or if you're eating or getting dressed, they sort of will push through all of your private time or any of the things that keep you autonomous. They will push through any boundaries. They are cheaters. They are controlling, they deflect, they are impulsive, um, they love bomb. This is a big one with superficial charm. This is somebody who behaves differently when you first meet them or in front of others. And then behind the scenes is altogether different. They. This is a huge one, passive aggression. So I see this uh, as a single woman on dating apps all the time where people are saying like, I'm fluent in sarcasm and I automatically swipe left because <laughs> actually it turns out that passive aggression is kind of like sarcasm's little brother. And there are there are ways that people communicate and infer through innuendo in little digs to sort of devalue you. So it's like, a, you know, death by a thousand cuts. All of those things over time sort of chip away um, and might become your inner dialogue to s sort of feel less about yourself. So passive aggression is a huge red flag. If someone is giving you jabs through innuendo or inference that way, this is a huge red flag. Um, silent treatment is another one. Somebody who kind of disappears and punishes you um, by doing so is a huge red flag. Superficiality. Um, and triangulation, somebody who kind of puts you against other people. If you become isolated, anything that sort of makes you feel less empowered or less autonomous, it's about them controlling you. And so um, those are a good bunch of things that I think are huge red flags. And as someone who's an expert in this, how is your narcissist radar these days? Like whether when, you, when you're running into someone, it could be on a and in a dating environment or a party or even at work, like how good, how attuned is yours? Like you're like, again, not that you would ever give them a clinical uh, diagnosis, but are you like, oh yeah, there's a good chance that person's a narcissist. Yeah, I think we have the more malignant overt versions of this that you could see coming a mile away. Um, but the more covert are really, really challenging to manage. Um, these are people that are kind of more victim mentality. They might stay in relationships for a very long time um, and they're really hard to see. And so I think in with my scenario in my past, it was pretty easy to see. And so I was able to flee pretty quickly. But there are a lot of my clients that come in that are in marriages for 30 years um, and surprise, surprise. So there's a lot of different versions of this. I find that one to be far more damaging. I would rather have an acute punch to the face than, as I mentioned, like death by a thousand cuts. And so those, those versions of this, even for someone as skilled as I am, are really, really challenging. Um, and I think the, the best of us can still fall for, for anybody who does that. And that's why when people ask me, how do you 
you protect yourself, I always say they're all around you. The only thing you can really do is just stay autonomous, stay connected to your passions, your friends, your finances. The narcissist is allergic to your autonomy. Wow. And you mentioned you sort of had a personal experience that drove you into this. Uh, some might say, if you have a personal experience, the last thing you want to do is deal in this world. Uh, did you have any internal fight there? Like, man, I kind of lived through this. Why do I want to make this part of even more part of, of who I am? Yeah, I think it was after my run across New York, I started to get, you know, people paying attention to the story. And um, my situ situation was where I was beginning to then get more, have more problems with my personal experience with the person in my life who was, who was, you know, always kind of there and ready to fight me around having a voice about this. Um and I remember my son said to me, you know, maybe you shouldn't do this anymore. And I was like, I can't, I have to, I have to help people. You know, I kind of, I had really kind of gotten to a point where I felt it was something I had to do as a legacy, as a service. And so, you know, I, I feel when I went to USC, I, I went to school for community organizing. So I've always been sort of the advocate mind. And so becoming a therapist was something that I had to do actually to pay bills. And I fell in love with that also. Um, but the advocacy piece is really very much about who I am. That is my passion is to sort of like kind of make a lot of noise around things that are important to me. Um, and so, yeah, I, I really think it's part of my fiber, but I, I don't think at this one I can unhand it. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, I know uh, post-traumatic uh, post stress is a thing and, does that ever like pop up in your life where you're dealing with uh, with a situation where either it's it's someone you're helping or you're in, in the middle of some reading about something where like, holy shit, you start getting flashbacks of like where you were? How, how do you separate that? Yeah, I think originally I did quite a bit um, the first two years uh, when I got out of there. So that was in 2020. I had a ton of that. Um, but I feel like in some ways I, excuse me, I was micro dosing exposure. So there's a lot of um, evidence around exposure therapy. So it was almost like if I didn't do any of this work and I didn't pay attention to that stuff, I think it would have taken me longer to heal. And so I think you have to pay attention to it just in little doses. Mm. And you mentioned earlier the fact that, uh, you know, judicial system. Tell me about this world of how the narcissism plays. Because we all know the judicial system is... is it's not as flawed as all hell, but it's probably the best is what we got. Uh, so uh, how does narcissism play, play a role in it? Yeah, this is a huge, huge problem. Uh, I put this in my book, but I did not co-parent with a narcissist. I was fortunate enough to get out of the relationship before um, there was any child or anything like that. So, but my clients come to me and they are being brutally abused by the judicial system on top of their own sort of personal terrorists coming after them. Why? Because the narcissist exploits things that are important to you. And so they will use children as the number one exploitation. They, this is like the chef's kiss for the narcissist because they know without a doubt, this is something that is important to you, your precious child. So this is like the playground. Uh, family court is the playground for the narcissist, not just as your personal terrorist or ex, but there are tons of attorneys and judges that are narcissists themselves. It is literally just, you know, in abundance. I can't even tell you. I've been there with my own scenario and trying to file restraining orders, and it's really horrifying to see what happens because it kind of happens in a vacuum. These are people that um, don't have any like guardians in there to sort of like watch over what's going on. And so they, this has been, you know, my client's biggest complaint thus far is the judicial system as it relates to family court and custody situations where, you know, they, these are people that are powerful they are CEOs, they are wealthy, they are charismatic, they are manipulative, um, and they know how to play the game and play the optics. So historically, I would say my clients have the hardest time navigating that. And what role do you play? Like, how can you help? Because, I, I mean, we all watch TV shows and movies when they bring in, 
the expert in a certain thing, whatever it is. Um, how, what, what kind of role do you play? Like, how are you able to help your clients in, in these situations? A lot of times I counsel them on how to become emotionally regulated so that they don't feed into the narrative that they are crazy. Um, all, a lot of my clients have post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, or complex post-traumatic stress disorder, CPTSD, which comes with, comes with sort of this agitation um, and easily easily triggered and so they can be highly emotive and this is problematic in those scenarios so they have to kind of temper what they really want to do which is you know cry and scream around the injustice that they've um, been managing so we do that and it checks a couple of different boxes because the narcissist hates when they don't get a reaction from you so i try to you know explain that the more that the more settled you are the more likely that the narcissist will reveal who they really are. And so it checks a bunch of boxes. And then, you know, I can also provide biopsychosocials or notes to reference the PTSD. PTSD is the only diagnosis that brings with it liability. So in the court of law, you know, we sort of try to flex around, you know, something or someone caused this. It's the only diagnosis that says like, hold on a second, this is your fault. Um, and so we try to, you know, shine a light on different things that might support them in those um, arenas. But that is where my clients suffer the most is family court. Wow. Um, let's look, look at both sides of this. Uh, say someone's listening to this and when you railed off all those like signs of a narcissist, they're like, holy shit, that could be me. Uh, you know, how do we, for lack of a better word, sorry, fix being a narcissist? If, if people feel like, oh boy. I'm sort of hitting these points. I, I mean, maybe they maybe they have the empathy piece, but they like do these other things like they're controlling or gaslighting or something like that. Like, is there a way to fix it if, if you identify yourself or believe that you have these narcissistic traits? I think the narcissist isn't really looking inward like that. So if you are listening to this and you are looking inward, more than likely you are not a narcissist. The narcissist is... Um, infallible in their own minds and is particularly delusional um so there's no insight there's not this moment where they're like oh maybe that's me by and large they know what they're doing and to sort of oversimplify no we have no data that suggests that people like this actually change i treat narcissists in my practice and oftentimes they'll say to me um which is kind of interesting you know i'm just wired like this um, they don't want to change because they think they're winning. They think that vulnerability and empathy are kind of like for losers. Um, they are, they're just in this mindset of, of victory. Um, and if you were, if you were sort of like somebody who was a more theological brain, you might say it was evil. Quite honestly, I am a science brained person. So I don't see it that way. I think that no empathy looks like evil. If somebody doesn't care about what happens to others, it comes off as sort of like, quote unquote, evil. Um, but they don't really have a desire. Somebody who has NPD really doesn't have a desire too much to change, you know, with the exception of some, or of being mandated. Um, but they don't really do that anyway. They sort of fake the funk and then um, might be able to behave a certain way for a short period of time and then kind of go back to their baseline, which would be, you know, destructive. Okay. Well, that's good because there were a couple of things you mentioned in your list. I'm like, man, am I a narcissist? I'm like, <laughs> like I've got into fights <laughs> with my wife where she'll say I'm too controlling. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> but I'm glad that you, that stipulation, whether if you are willing to look inside of yourself that you're not. So that's good because I'm always looking inside of myself and thinking what a jackass I am. So that's, that's good to know. And I'm sure someone listening or watching this may be like, Oh God, I'm like, so thank you for clearing that up. Um, one of the things that's been a sort of a, a through line of our conversation is it's like people with power, people with money is narcissism, like a first world problem. Like, and, and I don't mean it as, in, it as a joke, but I mean, it's like, is it, is it people that are affluent that are suffering from narcissism or is it, or does it run a spectrum there as well? I think it's everywhere. Um, I think what we're seeing with um, psychopaths specifically, psychopaths, I think one in four CEOs is a psychopath directly. So it's narcissism is very prevalent. 
Um, so too is psychopathy and antisocial personality disorder, but the psychopath tends to climb the ladders rather readily because they have no empathy and they don't really care who they hurt along the way. Um, there's just no limit to what they'll do to, you know, get successful. So, um, but no, it's not one of those things that I, I see it runs the gamut. We see the narcissist who is literally homeless that will put on a show so they can find somewhere to live. And then we see the version of this, as we mentioned, in really, really strong political climates. It's just kind of all over the map in terms of how it shows up. Wow. Um, yeah, I, it's 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 so fascinating because the way you've, you've, you've sort of painted the picture is it's there's nothing we could do about the narcissist. He, he, he or she is who she is. The, the only thing we can do is sort of prepare ourselves and guard ourselves. Am, am, I, am I reading that correctly? Yes. And I also feel like, you know, there's a lot of data coming out now around brain scans for empathy. What we might want to start doing as a society is, you know, kind of vetting who we put into positions of power um, and how to manage that. Because you know, while you want somebody who has some narcissistic traits, let's say, in a position of power, because if you're going up against other world leaders who are highly narcissistic, um, you know, you can't be a full on mush and, and pushover. Um, but to the extent that you might actually enjoy chaos, as a lot of antisocial people d do, uh, that's different, right? So you might actually, you know, create chaos in your own country just for sport. This is something we need to start talking about um, on a macro level. So I think there's probably a sweet spot and we're probably going to be trending in those directions soon enough, thank God, where we can begin to talk about what this looks like um, for world leader world leaders. And I don't know if there's data for this, Vanessa, but is are there more narcissists now today than there used to be because it's always like you know we always talk about the effects that technology has had on now multiple generations and i don't know if technology plays a piece here at all but is is are there data that you're seeing more diagnosed uh, uh, people with narcissism i mean is or is it just like now we're just more aware of it we're folks like yourself writing books like uh, are we just more aware of narcissism these days I think it's always been here. I think there are just a lot more people and I think people are vying for resources more than we realize. I also think that there is a hereditary component. So, you know, the problem is I can't reference, it's just a theory because narcissists are not coming into session or into studies saying, you know, hey, you know, check me out, study me, I'm a narcissist. So it's really hard to kind of, pinpoint exactly but my sense is that it's an age-old tale i think social media brings out low-level narcissism but that's not the real kind of um issue i think people throw that around a lot in terms of who's taking selfies etc but you know somebody who has real npd it is way bigger than this seemingly self-love approach it's something a far more devious right yeah i mean i'm joking earlier about the fact that like we throw these words around and and i like you're right if you see someone who's constantly posting on social media you know thirst traps you're like oh that person's a narcissist but like yeah really that's not the, what the definition of narcissist is it's there's more to that um and i mentioned your book which is narcissistic abuse a therapist's guide to identifying escaping and healing from toxic and manipulative people uh you break down the five stages of narcissistic abuse and i want to go into a couple because a couple of these words are like huh what does that mean uh, so one is mask slipping. What is mask slipping? Sure. So mask slipping is when the narcissist realizes that maybe they are being found out or they have gotten tired of wearing the mask for any variety of reasons. They will begin to reveal their true self. So this is after sort of the idealization phase or the love bombing phase where um, they begin to show you who they really are. Um, and that can come up in, as I mentioned, like the silent treatment or devaluing slightly. And then you begin to see um, who the person really is. They let go of the front. Hmm. And the, another one, the, the other step was discarding. I'm assuming that's when you just kind of throw the person overboard, basically. 
Sure. So in the cycle of abuse, we have the idealization phase or the love bombing phase in the first place. Then we have the tension building. So that in the cycle, it begins to get very tense and there's some devaluing that goes on. And then we have the discard or the fallout um, and it repeats. So the discard seems like it's just a discard over like at the end of the relationship. But the discard happens on repeat because it's just maybe like a quasi discard the first times around till it's finally a real discard. But that cycle repeats over and over and over again until it develops into a trauma bond. And that is where the victim is looking for the idealization phase to show up again. It's very kind of Pavlovian psychology 101 where we're looking for that positive reinforcer to show up. Um, and that happens until we become basically addicted to it. Um, most people who come to me describe this as feeling very much like an addiction to the highs that come with the love bombing phase. And so um, that's basically what it looks like in the cycle of abuse. And we've been talking about men mostly as narcissists in this conversation. Uh, but is that the case? Is it mostly men have these narcissistic tendencies? It is, but I will say I have a ton of clients that come to me that are the daughters of narcissistic mothers. Um, and I think this is something that's, again, even more underreported because I think it's hard for men to come forward and say I'm being abused. Um, they probably don't feel heard, seen, believed, etc. But I have a lot of the daughters of and this kind of scenario is very, very, very painful for the children of narcissists. Why? Because as somebody who got out of a relationship with a narcissist, I was able to go find that girl again. If you're being raised by a narcissist, you have to find your identity in the first place. So that's really an uphill battle is to kind of find out who you even really are without being an extension of the narcissistic parent. And so um, while we talk about the interpersonal relationship, like love affair version of this, the children of narcissists have a bigger hill to climb. And I think we, we kind of alluded to this, but is, it, is this genetic, do you think? Is there, is, there, is there information out there that says, like, a narcissist is going to have it? Like, you know, we talk about addiction. Like, addiction is, is there's facts that, there's, that there, it is genetic. So are we seeing that narcissists are having more narcissists? So we're, <laughs> we're just going to keep making these narcissist babies out there? Yeah, we see a lot of, uh, data coming out now around it being hereditary or more biological versus, you know, kind of the nature more than the nurture. Um, and I tend to be in that camp. I see a lot of lineage and it could be, um, you know, intergenerational trauma, which we're seeing a lot of studies around now. So it remains to be seen, but I definitely am in the camp of more nature versus nurture. I think there are too many people that get traumatized that do not behave this way. Wow. Um, and in terms of someone who's experienced this and been in a relationship with someone who's, who's a narcissist, what's the recovery like? Like, because I wonder, because we even mentioned the fact that, you know, the PTSD that you, you had experienced and, and even doing this full time, but does it, does it linger? Is there like sort of like this long COVID feel like where all of a sudden that all they're seeing is narcissists everywhere and they have trouble escaping that? Or, or is there a way to, to break that cycle? I think the brain is a fact finding machine. It looks for patterns. And so if you get gaslit for too long or lied to for too long, it can be destabilizing and actually create an injury to the brain. I don't think the brain is going to compute non facts and it becomes very destabilizing for people. And so it takes quite a while to undo that brain injury. Fortunately, for people who have a neurotypical brain, you can create, you know, different pathways and it's more, there's neuroplasticity. So you can fix that and remedy that much, much quicker than somebody who has a rigid disorder that's pathological, like someone with NPD. So there's tons of hope. I think do the work, find a therapist that gets it, um, you know, get involved in being validated by other people. And those people should be authentic and truth tellers. And you'll begin to find your way. But it is a big journey to kind of rewire things. Um, it gets really scary when you get lied to with such a high level of frequency. It can be very, very scary for people. And for folks that are listening to this, watching this, and I don't want this to be a therapy session for anyone, but 
maybe they could, they're in a relationship, maybe married to a person, they love this person for whatever reason, and the person is a narcissist. And they just hang around because either family commitments, money, what, what, what words of advice do you give to folks like that, 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 that understand the situation that they're in, but it's almost like too hard to break free from this narcissist. And I'm sure it's something that you've probably seen on a regular basis. What, what do you say to folks like that? It is very hard. There are so many reasons why people stay and I honor all of them. Uh, I always am of the idea though, that it's better to get away because when I was training for Ironman races, I would envision the finish line. And I would, I remember, um, he hearing the voice of, um, Mike Riley saying, Vanessa Riser, you are an Ironman. And I would dream about it and fast and I would be fascinating. And I would, I would just think about it all the time. And I knew that the finish line of that race that day was coming with or without my training. So two years from now, let's say, you know, September 30th of 2026 is coming with or without anything that we, we can't help it. It's coming with or without our, our help. It's, there's nothing we can do about it. Where do you see yourself at that time? Do you see yourself still suffering or do you see yourself doing the work to get out of this? Um, it could be a long road, um, but that finish line is yours and you can get past this. You can find a way. I have clients that have, you know, four kids and tons of businesses and lots to untangle, but, uh, you know, it's better to live the rest of your life free um, in a tiny little hut somewhere versus being owned by somebody. Um, it kind of reminds me of being like a bird in a cage, but the cage door is open. You know, you can do it. It's a lot of times they're intimidated um, and they're, they've are they been dealing with intimidation for so long that they can't see their way out. But there are ways to do it slowly. Um, so I'm always of the camp to get out. If you have to stay, then you have to practice harm reduction, which would be kind of minimizing contact. Um, but it's, it's really hard because they're so manipulative. They're going to reel you in. You're going to fall for it. You think you're not, but you are. You can't really be around people like this without losing yourself. And so for people that decide to make that hard decision to break free from a narcissist, and you, you, you kind of alluded to earlier about you know children with narcissists, how do you co-parent with a narcissist? Because I feel like even if, if you know, take the uh, legal recourse out of it, maybe it's just they're just being assholes for, for lack of a better word. Um, how do you, how do you co-parent with someone who you're basically going to be stuck with in, in some capacity for the, the extended period of, of, of your children's lives until they reach adulthood and any tips for that? Yeah. I think you have to minimize interaction as much as possible. For instance, if you say, you know, little Jimmy can't have peanut butter, he's going to break out in, you know, a rash, you're guaranteeing that little Jimmy gets peanut butter. So anytime you engage with them, you have to unhand logic. They're going to exploit the information that you're sharing and use it against you and your children. They don't care. They have no empathy. So this is just for sport. This is like a cat and mouse game. So they're going to play with you, um, you know, just because. And so you can't really engage with them. You have to minimize communication, almost like a business transaction. Everything that you say to them and, and with them has to be in written word. You can't communicate over the phone unless you're recording it because you know, it's just highly litigious for them. It's, it's just the, the judicial system is where they're going to bring you. So it's, it's hard. It's, it's not, um, it's not a one kind of size fits all. You have to kind of think about it on a situation by situation basis, but it, that is the hardest thing is to co-parent with them. Um, I always, I'm, a, I'm of, of the religion that we we can't change, but we can evolve. We can get better. We could become like almost like software updates. We can we could become a better version of our own iPhone. Um, age. Does a narcissist get better with age? Or I mean, is it is there is it something like maybe something evolves? Because I've always felt like you know if I've met if I knew someone when they were in their teens, they were a complete prick, and then I ran into it twenty years later, they seem like a nice person. Obviously. It, this is not psychopathy or anything like that, but is there any evolution to to a to a narcissist? It's interesting. I I I actually think I'm more in the camp of they get worse. Really? Yeah, because they are very vain, and so as they see 
their fracture of their delusional, fantastical world, they become even more upset, uh, more aggravated. Over time, people will also become savvy to who they are. Um, and this is the worst thing is for them to ever become found out. And so I think, you know, we're seeing that sometimes like you like with P. Diddy, you know, he had everything going for him and he was writing this out and then he will ultimately be exposed and then and then ultimately suicidal. We saw this with Jeffrey Epstein as well. So I think when they get found out and the house of cards begins to fall, they are it is highly problematic for them, which it, they don't change. And so that's generally the trajectory of it is actually for everything to fall. You mentioned Diddy and, you know, we could we could list a whole bunch of shitty people, uh, you know, Harvey Weinstein, you know, the Matt Lowers of the world. When it comes down to it, are they essentially just malignant narcissists? Like, is that is that part of the drive of what makes them such horrible people? Or or is it maybe something more or something less to them? Or is, do you think that's pretty much a driver when it comes to, you know, all the folks that came out of the Me Too movement, like the real assholes of the Me Too movement? Like, is it is it easy to say, like, that's a big part of why they did what, what, what they did? I would say so. Um, you know, and while I don't know them and I can't diagnose them, I, I see so many overlaps and characteristics that are so um, narcissistic and sociopathic and psychopathic that with each of the people that you mentioned that it, I have almost no doubt in my mind that that's what's going on is there's a pathological disorder, especially for those of the characters that are um, involved in sex trafficking. Why? Because every narcissist, sociopath, or psychopath is essentially a cult leader. You're either in a cult of one or a cult of many. And you can see what they're doing is they have like these minions and they have um, this real eagerness to groom. So when you see people who are going after very young, um, either lovers or people that work for them, anybody that they can groom, this is a huge red flag. So you're looking at sort of this cult mentality. And I think that that's actually what my book is about. It fuses the concepts of cult abuse and narcissistic abuse as you're in a cult of one, a cult of five in a, in a family system, let's say, or in, as we mentioned, in these huge political cults. But anytime you see them trying to groom young people, this is a huge red flag. Her name is Vanessa Reiser. The name of the book is Narcissistic Abuse, A Therapist's Guide to Identifying, Escaping, and Healing from Toxic and Manipulative People. Vanessa, thank you much, so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And that's going to do it for today's Good Listen. I'm Joe Partavilla. You can always connect with me on X, LinkedIn, or Instagram at Joe Partavilla or on TikTok at Jay Partavilla. If you're watching this on YouTube, I would appreciate it if you could tap that big old thumbs up button. It's a small gesture, but it really helps my channel. If you want to share your story with me, uh, just shoot me an email, joepartavilla at protonmail.com. Thanks again for spending some time with me today. I will see you next time. Adios.